Sometimes life presents you with something unexpected. A new way becomes clear and your plans change before you even realize what's happened to you. My name is Sofia Papinassi and I'm a pianist and researcher from Florence. When I first came across music from the Theresienstadt ghetto camp, I had no idea I'd embark on such an intense journey, hear stories from Holocaust survivors, learn from their experiences and discover what music and art had meant to them during one of the most horrible times of their lives. Most of all, I've learned how music has remained with them since their liberation. When you listen to a music, you are, you are in a different place. You're not in Terezin. Music is food for the soul. This altered every part of me. Three years ago, I was somebody completely different. One day, while driving on the way to the conservatory, I was captivated by a composition on the radio, an energetic and powerful piece by the Czech composer Pavel Haas, named A Study for Strings. Afterwards, I learned that Haas composed this music while he was a prisoner at Theresienstadt, where it was performed more than once by an orchestra of fellow inmates. Sharing a tragic fate with most of the ghetto's musicians, Haas was forced onto a cattle truck bound for Auschwitz soon after, and eventually met his end in its gas chambers in 1944. I was stunned. I knew Pavel Haas by name, but I didn't know about his sad demise. Not being able to turn that music off in my mind, I bought my first score by one of the greatest Theresienstadt composers. The following days were accompanied by the rhythmic energy and haunting melodies of Pavel Haas's piano suite. I visited the Czech town of Terezin, 60 kilometers away from Prague. Here I learned that in November 1941 the Nazis started to transform this town into Theresienstadt, a unique ghetto camp within the history of the Holocaust. Over 140,000 European Jews were deported here, including some of the greatest composers, musicians and artists of their generation. Their talent became a Nazi tool used to transform Theresienstadt into a propaganda showcase to convince the world that Jewish people were treated well. 
even though they were forced to live in unspeakable conditions, Jewish composers and musicians continued to write and perform music, knowing this work would very well be their last. And in many cases, it was. Only 23,000 of the people deported to Theresien survived the Holocaust. How could such beautiful music be created within such darkness? How did this music survive? What did it mean to the prisoners? Before I started working on this project, I'd never even imagined I would be the one behind the camera, sitting in front of Holocaust survivors and asking them to give an interview. How did my life change? I had only myself to worry about. I had nothing. You left everything behind. Your house, your home, your material things, everything was left behind and taken 20 kilos of whatever into a bag, put on your coat and go. Be taken to Terezin. And that, that was the rule. This is my order for transport to the Terezin concentration camp. And I was the youngest in that transport. I was seven years old. We were close to 1,200 people. At the end, there would be just a handful alive. And we were sent by train. It was still a regular train, very, very crowded, couldn't get out anymore, very little food. And we arrived in Czechoslovakia. And so I came to Terezin with my doll in my arm, a little duffel bag, and metal dishes. We had to walk close to two kilometers to the camp. And it was made up of these brick, huge brick barracks, brick walls, barbed wire, and wooden fences, totally sealed off from the outside world. We landed up in the, one of the fortresses, the biggest one, Dresden Fortress, in the attic, on the floor, no bed, nothing. Well, we left in uh, November 1942, and uh, when we arrived in Terezin, I was immediately separated from my mother and my sister and sent to a uh, school building, which was considered sort of a home for uh, boys who were my age. I was then 12 years old. Since taking photographs was strictly forbidden, the prisoners could only rely upon art and drawings, which secretly illustrated the strange conditions and torment they were forced to live with. Some drawings and compositions were hidden in the most unusual places, such as the roofs and walls of the barracks and even in mattresses. These treasured memories are among the only sources which document the daily routines the prisoners had to go through, including those which were most feared. Well, every time there came an order from the Germans to the government, to the management, to put together a thousand people in two days to the station to take to the east. So there was always somebody you knew, a member of the family, or depending. Uh, and that happened all the time. Most of the kids that I was with, unfortunately, had to, were shipped out to Auschwitz. That's where the, we didn't know that the trains were going there or what it was, but they always said they were going to the east. Terezin was a place of fear, hunger and torment. However, some strove to raise the spirits of the inmates, as seen in the initiatives of composer Gideon Klein and conductor Raphael Schechter. Už v 41. roce, když přijel, potkal v sudeckých kasárnách Rafaela Šechtra. To byl náš blízký kamarád. A to byl takový nezmar, že on utvořil už v tom 41. roce na, o Vánocích a potom hned z kraje 
zbor z těch mužských, který ve dne dřeli a večer zpívali se šechtrem ve zboru. A neměli noty, neměli nic. Tak jakmile přijel Gideon, tak šechtr si u něho objednal harmonizaci nějakých písní. A on udělal celou sérii, harmonizoval národní písně. A ty se zpívají dodnes s ohromným obdivem. A tam, když si vzpomenu, že nebyl ani notový papír, že si museli udělat linky, tak takhle začala ta velká kultura v Terezi. The great culture of Terezin, as Eliška holds it, secretly started with singing. And it's so touching to think that even when exhausted from hard labor, this man put together the last energies to sing. At the time, musical activities were still prohibited, but later the Nazis realized they could take advantage of the presence of great artists who couldn't simply disappear out of the blue. Theresienstadt gradually became a propaganda tool and artistic performances were authorized. The organization included concerts, theatrical productions, opera, lectures and cabaret. You could um, perform whatever you were capable of. There was an orchestra, there was a conductor, a famous one who conducted around the world and a uh, lot of members of the uh, Czech Philharmonic were Jews uh, and others were taken as well. First of all, Terrazin had the most famous, you know, of the intelligentsia, the best musicians from all of Europe and uh, the, the best doctors, the best of everything. There was some music in the, in the square, uh, there was a band there and I found out what a trombone is. I didn't know what a trombone was and I was quite fascinated by a trombone. When we got a permission from the Germans that we can play music, they say, yes, of course, but of course we knew that they have power over us that even if they let us play music here, they can send us off to Auschwitz or to anything. I was an actress in one of the companies. You know, they were best directors and uh, best in every, in every field. There were a lot of very good people. Yeah. Je to neuvěřitelné, jakou úroveň měli všechny tyto kreace. Takže jednou Gidon i napsal, že lec, která metropole světa by mohla závidět koncertní sezóně té úrovni v terezínském getu. One conductor gave me a flute. She brought a flute out of wood. And so I tried to play that, but of course I couldn't. They did give concerts. I knew about that. Except when you had Rundivar, yes, everybody wanted to see it, even if we didn't understand one word. It was just good to be in the place. One thing that uh, we learned from uh, our leader, the teacher that we had, was a cannon. I never knew what a cannon was. But uh, uh, I think uh, we had uh, Frere Jacques, you know, the three groups singing it at different times. He got us interested in music, and uh, uh, I was in, uh, in the children's chorus in Terezin, while the Brundi Bar was uh, performed 55 times. Didn't have to wear a star when they were performing. So it gave them a little 
feeling of liberation. The whole point of a Brunibar is that the organ grinder who had a mustache just like Hitler, he was defeated. And that's what made everybody happy because everybody associated him with Hitler and felt that one of these days Hitler was going to get defeated. Among those committed to ensuring that the children had a musical upbringing was Gideon Klein, who became the head of chamber music activities at the Freizeitgestaltung, or Department of Leisure Time. As well as teaching the children, Klein was one of the most active musicians, giving piano recitals as well as playing in different kinds of ensembles. Yes, I met Gideon Klein. In the attic, in one of the buildings, was a grand piano. And uh, we were rehearsing on the stage for the next play. And then we all left. And I was the slowest one, the last one. And as I was getting out, Gideon Klein was coming in. And he said, stay here, I'll play something for you. So I stayed in, there were wooden chairs, the stage and the grand piano, and he went up and played Chopin's Etude for me, which was a concert piece. You know, an artist like this, playing in the attic, for one member of the audience. It was so emotional for me to play the piano sonata Gideon composed in Theresienstadt in front of one of his friends, especially on Stenka's piano, the very same instrument she used when taking lessons from one of the best pianists of Theresienstadt, Elis R. Sommer. Elis gave many recitals in the ghetto, even though she was working in the munitions factory and had only one hour a day in a broken grand piano on which to practice. Alice was one of the performing uh, artists. She gave concerts. That's where I saw her the first time, but uh, didn't talk to her, of course, because, you know, she was a celebrity. Her husband was taken away into a working group somewhere out and didn't come back. Fifty years after the war, I'll say, my baby, we uh, came to live to London, and this is where I met Alice again. She survived in Terezin, so of course I had an opening line that I have seen her in Terezin, and it became the closest friendship you can imagine. I went to see her every Sunday. Um, she was still playing. She died when she was 103, I think, or 107. Before she became, became very ill, she used to come here and give me lessons. So, you know, it was life after the war. And she was the only one that I really met who was there at the same time and who I met in England. Like 
Haley Sir Solner, who stayed in Theresienstadt until the camp was liberated, Stenka, like many other musicians and artists, was deported to Auschwitz in October 1944. Just a few months before, the Nazis were working on a propaganda movie which involved many of the camp's musicians in its production. This small fragment of the original film captures a short orchestral performance by the inmates. Some works by composers Pavel Haas and Hans Krasa were played under the direction of conductor Karel Anser. A small detail of the set demonstrates how Nazi propaganda worked. The flowers that appear to decorate the stage are there to cover the fact that many musicians didn't have shoes. That wasn't the first time the musicians' talents were used for painting Theresienstadt as a normal town. Both Verdi's Requiem and Brundibar were performed in front of visiting International Red Cross representatives. For many of the artists, this performance and the subsequent recording was their last time to perform. All too frequently, prisoners would sing or play one day and be sent to Auschwitz the next. I came to Therese in 1942, in February, and stayed two and a half years, and suddenly it looked as though the war was coming to an end and the Germans wanted to cancel Terezin, so there was a transport of thousand people chosen from the inhabitants every two or three days. Nobody could know who will be chosen, so when uh, 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 Raphael Schechter was chosen, that was at the same time as I was chosen, so that we could be, we happened to be in the same train, the same compartment. Schechter was sitting opposite me like you, exactly. I remember his last act. And out of his pockets, he put a piece of bread that we got as a portion, gave it to me and then said, give it to me, here is a spoon, this is my last supper, and it almost was. But he survived some time in Auschwitz and uh, died later in another camp. Those who survived are very, very few. There was Gideon Klein's sister, Eliska, uh, with whom I could share some memories, but very, very few people. I can only tell you that there were 140,000 people from Czechoslovakia that were sent to Terezin. I think 90,000 were sent to Auschwitz from, from there. 30,000 died in Terezin, and the rest stayed in Terezin. So that's about 25,000 of that stayed there, so around 30. On the evening of May the 8th, 1945, the Red Army liberated Theresienstadt, finally setting free its prisoners. I can't stop wondering what the next generations will inherit from this time in history. What did humanity learn from these stories? What can we learn? And how can we ensure that these precious memories will be venerated? Neska víme, že tam byly vytvořeny skladby, které mají ve, ve vývoji evropské hudby svoje místo. A byli to skladatelé jako Viktor Ulman, Pavel Haas, Hans Krása, Gideon Klein. A dneska to obdivuje celý svět, můžu říct.
ten obrovský zázrak, kde byla vytvořena taková díla za tak krutých podmínek, který si vůbec nikdo nemůže představit. Eliška dedicated her life to sharing the music of her brother Gideon and the other composers who were in the ghetto. To me, she's an example, like others, who fought to keep their memory alive. But even now, there are new things to discover. I met the grandson of Hans Winterberg, a composer who stayed in Theresien for a few months in 1945, and whose compositions were locked inside the German Institute until Peter inherited all of Winterberg's music estate. Thanks to him, we can hear these compositions again. What do you know about Winterberg's life in Theresienstadt? Because he was there very in a very short time, from January 1945 to May 1945. So but I could find one composition he made in Theresien because it is titled Theresien Suita, and on the other side you can read. Now that this music is being played all over, all over the world, how mm -hmm. do you feel? It's, uh, I'm very, very happy that now I can work on his estate, on, on my grandfather's music. And the whole world, world is interested in this music. Like, And more com uh, musicians are interested in this music after they get aware of it. And this makes me very, very deeply happy, deeply, very deep inside to see what my grandfather has done, that he was a fantastic human, as far as I can see, and a fantastic composer. Like some people say, he was not successful and therefore he was not good. That's wrong absolutely wrong. For Peter, it has been a mission to keep the music of his grandfather alive and to allow others to experience his talent. From 2022, Winterberg's work is part of one of the major classical music publishers' catalogues, being ready to once again rise from the manuscripts and take its place in the musical annals of history. For me, playing this music is paying homage to those who were there, not only the performers, but also to those who were listening and those who died. You know, all those people, had they lived, would have made a big career, every one of them. For themselves and for the country. A lot of very talented people. The prisoners of Theresienstadt relied on music and art to express feelings, the depth of which one can hardly imagine. They uh, sang the songs themselves, so it, it just made everybody feel good. Music is food 
for the soul and the heart. It brings you to a different level of being. Even if you're hungry, it feeds you. I like to think that even if some of them do not belong to this world anymore, they are somewhere singing.